Good morning. We sat under our names, so in case <laughs> no one knows <laughs> the people in the panel. The <laughs> um, so good morning to everyone. Welcome to Madrid. Uh, thank you to Luis and Jose Manuel for inviting me to moderate this uh, panel. As you have seen, audio has been mentioned already through across all the sessions, so it's the talk of the town. So I'm very glad that we're going to uh, discuss it in depth for the next, I think it's the next uh, 35 minutes, okay? And then there's coffee, so relax. Uh, after this session, we'll have a coffee break, um, so we're almost done. Um, actually, in this context that Enrico has mentioned and the other uh, speakers, as you know, uh, audio has been growing worldwide. Uh, Michelle, last week, uh, through the uh, American Audio Association, declared that they had 11 consecutive years of audio, double-digit audio growth. Congratulations. Thank you. Hard to keep. Let's see next year, <laughs> but keep in there. In Germany, uh, different sources indicate that you also have had five years of consecutive double-digit growth, and it closely represents between 7 and 10% total sales, close to what Enrico has uh, 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 indicated that might happen at the end of this year. And in the Spanish market, we started late, as you know, uh, in the audio game, but we spin it up, and we also had had in the last five years 50% annual growth. So in this growth uh, context, uh, I would like to welcome uh, my three colleagues. Uh, I have Michelle Kopp, who is the executive director of the Audio Publishers Association at the Podcast Academy, uh, and she's also a partner at the Forty Business Consulting Group, which provides uh, services to the publishing community. Welcome to Madrid. Uh, Thank I know you. you've been traveling. We met in London a week ago, <laughs> and then you've been in Abu Dhabi, and you're here. Um, welcome. Thanks, thanks for making the effort of being in Madrid. Um, Loris is coming from uh, Paris, so he's uh, close by. She's a Colombian-American journalist and a podcast producer from Queens, New York. Uh, she's the founder of the Studio Ochenta, a multicultural podcast studio based in Paris and dedicated to creating engaging content in French, English, and Spanish simultaneously. Uh, we'll talk more about it. <laughs> Thank you, Laurie, for being here with us. Thank you. Okay, and Kurt Thielnil? Thielen. 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 Sorry, my German. I don't mind. All right, okay. <laughs> He's the founder, manager, and director of Civil Illusion, one of the biggest digital distributors for music and audiobooks worldwide. Uh, five years ago, you were given the Audiobook Person of the Year Award. Do you get any free subscriptions to all the German uh, <laughs> streaming platforms, or, or just no, an award? No, just an award from the publishers, not from the platforms. Oh, okay. So, all right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> congratulations <laughs> on that. So, as you've seen, we have three people from different point of views, from the publishing community, from the production community, and from the distribution community. So, we're going to go in-depth into different topics. We basically, as we've seen from the numbers, um, there was a growth scenario, and we want to look four or five years from now. What are the challenges and the opportunities in the audio space five years from now? So I know, as Enrico has said, the numbers, you know, we can take it as given, uh, but based on your experience, based on your day-to-day -day, uh, work, I think you can give a lot of insights uh, to, to the uh, public out here. So the panel is going to be structured as follows. Each one of them is going to have now three minutes, and I'm going to be very rigid with the time allocated, OK? Uh, in which they're going to basically share with you all what are the main challenges and opportunity in the next five years. After those three minutes, then we will engage in a, in a, in a debate among us. And then we'll leave the last five, 10 minutes for Q&As. In case you don't have questions, we will continue doing ourselves. OK, so who wants to start, who wants to start first? Michelle, you want to go? Okay. Sure. Um, I'll start because we have some exciting data that talks to the challenges and the opportunities uh, in audio. So you've heard many times today, 11 years of double-digit growth. But even more important, we saw from the Audio Publishers Association consumer survey with Edison Research that for the first time, we have over half of the US population who has ever listened to an audiobook. So that's 53% that speaks to the growth that we're experiencing. However, I look at it from the sort of glass half empty uh, perspective. That means 47% of the US public has never listened to an audiobook. And there is our opportunity. But what the public is telling us is that they would like the experience to be easy. They would like the experience to be in a place where they are finding other 
types of audio material like podcast and music, and we're seeing some retailers come into the fold who can bring that together. However, that's going to speak to a potential change in business models, and this becomes very scary for publishers. This is the challenge. How are the publishing houses going to make money? How are the authors going to make money if we're changing from a credit model into something that is more like an all-you-can-eat model? Now, the good news is that we've seen the difference between television and film. One for a long time was free, ad-supported, very similar to the podcast in the audio world. And then there was the kind of credit model, that movie model, where you went and bought a ticket to something and experienced it. And even in a digital world where those two types of video performance have come together and are really hard to, to distinguish, we've seen growth in both areas. So I think that there's an opportunity there, even though it's scary and it does require us to make some changes, I think that there's a lot of potential. However, you know, we, we have to keep thinking about the fact that Nobody knows what the difference between an audiobook and a podcast is, and how are those things going to come together? A producer can tell us, in many ways, they are produced in the same manner. So the next big challenge that I think comes into the fold is, we know we're gonna com be competing against other types of media, like video, and then how do we help people discover audio? And that's where we're starting to see some traction with things like book talk. We are getting influencers to talk about audio. And I think as podcasters, we've been pretty good about marketing, and as book publishers, maybe not so good. So we have an opportunity to learn from other areas, to make progress there, and to reach all of these other people that are not currently reading books and are not currently listening to books. So I think in the next five years, we're going to see a lot of changes that are similar to things that we've seen in the video space, but we have to be able to be flexible, to be open to new models, and to be open to really marketing titles in new and interesting ways that don't just reflect the, the product that we're looking at at that moment, but reflect the ecosystem, series, author names, brands, even publishers as name. Again, I, I think that there's a lot of potential, but here, here comes the future. Let's get ready. Okay, thank you, Michelle. We'll go in depth, in depth later on. Laurie, next, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to give some context about my company because we do a very particular work. So Studio Chenta is a multilingual podcast company. We produce original series in multiple languages, and we also consult and produce translated versions of existing series for platforms like Audible, Spotify, um, and the like in different markets. So some of the things that we've been seeing, because we're partially a translation company, is obviously the conversation around AI. Um, my view is that in the next years, it's going to facilitate a lot of the adaptations that are happening coming from the book world. Um, we are no longer in a time where we think we're going to release something in one language and then see if it works, and then three or four years later, translate it. Um, this has also been the case for you know, Netflix, releasing something and translating, subtitling it immediately. So we're thinking global stories first already in other media, and that's also being applied to audio, and AI is going to facilitate that. It's going to make it more automated. It's going to make it easier for you as publishers to decide, I'm going to license this already for all of these other languages, because I can, and I, it is going to be easier for you to do it. And you can hire companies like mine to do that kind of thing. Um, however, I will say that some Something that we are also seeing is the importance of communities. One of the biggest challenges for publishers of all kinds, whether they're in podcasting, the book industry, you name it, newspapers, whatever kind of creative content that you're doing, your biggest challenge is marketing. People don't like to think about marketing in the beginning of the conversation around content. We always think, okay, we're going to make something great. It's going to be creative. It's going to be mind-blowing. And then after the fact, you think, oh, wait, we have to market it. And uh, do we have that budget? Not necessarily this quarter. 
it's not going to happen as, as much as we can. So what is happening now and what will continue to happen and what will also save us from AI completely replacing everything is the idea of using these influencers that you mentioned um, to bring those communities from the very beginning to your new content. So we're talking about uh, any new content that you're working on, whether it's a podcast, whether it's a, you know, a, a new series, your authors, promoting your authors and all the work that they're doing around their communities, using those to help do your marketing and not spend so much on marketing, but actually use those communities from the very beginning. AI voices don't have communities yet. I mean, maybe one day there will be a robot AI with you know, a million followers on Instagram, but for now, Maybe there is already, but I would say for the book industry, um, authors being able to voice their own content is also very valuable, especially when they already have existing communities. So I will say that that's something that we're already seeing in podcasting, no matter what country it is, no matter what language that we're working in. Ochenta covers 27 languages. So we've seen the same kind of model happening. And the final thing uh, that I wanted to say is um, audio fiction um, being a lever of opportunity for audio um, Companies like podcast, po seeing podcasts as part of an opportunity to bring new users to your audiobook platforms. So if you say um, you have an, somebody who has a habit of listening to audiobooks or they already have a habit of listening to audio fiction, they can come to your platform or your publisher for audio stories. And so the conversation that's going to happen in the next few years, and this is what I'm predicting, is that we're going to be talking more about audio stories and not dividing so much and a little bit blurring the line between podcasting and audiobooks in that sense. And Thank you, it. Laurie. Yeah. Um, we'll go in depth into that crossover between podcasts and audiobooks to audio stories, because I think it will bring a lot of business opportunities to the publishing sector. Kurt, all yours. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I already know for, of one big UK publisher who has an all audio policy. And I think in five years' time, we'll see that producing an audio with a book is the, the very normal thing, and that there will be an audiobook going with every, every book which is, is published. Um, we see that audio is growing in strength as well in the, in, in the newspaper and magazine sector. Um, many um, many uh, magazines like The Econ Economist offer an audio version of their magazine and now the New York Times app, uh, the audio app, is the, the, the clear sign. They're leading the way as they very often do in the digital space. And I think that'll, that's a clear sign of a, of a further importance of audio. Um, with all this content, we obviously have to have a way of bringing it to, to the consumer and making money with it. And I think well, I'm totally convinced that going like having more or less one shop only is not the right strategy for that. We need um, wide distribution. Um, Tom Webster said at the APAC in 2019, I believe. Um, when he was asked about his main findings, um, he, he was very clear saying, bring your audiobooks where the consumers are, because the consumer is not going where you want him to go. They'll make their own choice. They'll go to, the, to a platform they enjoy. And if that contains audiobook, they'll consume it. If not, you have lost the customer. And I, f I think that is a very, um, very essential uh, part of the way. That, the challenge with that is changing the marketing approach, because you need to have another strategy to reach people. Social media will be much more important, but as well platforms where you can, uh, uh, which are dedicated to, to presenting uh, audiobooks. We are very successful with, uh, with distributing to uh, places like uh, Spotify, Apple Music, um, um, Napster, Deezer, and all these platforms, um, especially in Germany, but as well in other territories. And we've created a world around that because you need to really look at what you're doing there and how you bring the content to the people. That's absolutely essential. And I think the last thing is, when in, in the next five years, I think the, the formats will change. We'll see that, um, like we are now seeing TikTok on YouTube Shorts. It's not a three-minute or five-minute video anymore. It's a 30-second video in many cases. So people are 
adjusting their, their habits to that, and I think we need to adjust to that as well. Um, I think a lot comes down to serialization. Um, a 12-hour audio book might be a good series. We'll have to learn from podcasts as well. Um, podcasts are now half an hour, sometimes less. Um, so I think if a content is right for that, um, that'll, be, that'll be a good strategy um, to go for that. Audio drama in Germany, something like radio plays, I tried to explain that to people in the US and the UK for the last 10 years. It's something which is produced to go to the consumer, not, never was on the radio. It's hugely successful in Germany. Um, that's a good, good example for how this can be done and how, how um, these things can, make, uh, can be made a success. And I really think that the conversion of podcast and, and uh, audiobook is, is a fact which will happen. And I've, I think um, it, it will be a, a really good conversion. And the content will determine which format you use. Very good. Well, thank you for your initial uh, thoughts. Let's go into some of your um, uh, comments. Uh, since most of the people in this room are professionals from the publishing sector, and the three of you but especially you, Michelle, have mentioned money business models initially. I want to go into that topic. And uh, last week I was listening to a podcast that it was an interview of the CEO of a Spotify. Uh, I strongly recommend anyone, everyone in the room to listen to it. It's, it's, uh, the, the podcast name is Acquire. And he talks about audiobooks and the way he thinks about the potential of this uh, uh, sector. And he, and he was asked about, you know, why Although it's growing, you know, at a, but, but you, you, you turn around the bottom and say 45% of the people are not listening to it. Right. And he says that it's an, it's an issue, a problem of scale because of the business model. He basically says today it's being listened by tens of millions, but it could be listened by hundreds of millions, and it's because of the business model. He represents a platform, but I think it was very interesting to listen that it's not the format that is making it growing, it's also the business model, the way it's being consumed. And also we'll go later on to the podcast because it's more or less the same kind of as the business model, the consumption model that most people are using it. So can the three of you give us some insights about three, five years from now, three years from now, what kind of new business models? I mean, we come in, in the US Anglo-Saxon markets from a, a, a dominant one credit model. Here in Europe, we've seen you know, the unlimited subscription models have taken off, especially also to, uh, in, in Latin America. But do you see new business models coming into the picture? I mean, I certainly see that the credit model, which is what the U.S. system was built on, right? That is a form of subscription. It keeps someone on the platform. It keeps them, you know, getting titles, listening to titles. But even Audible in the U.S. now has more of a hybrid model where you've got a credit subscription, but you also have access to a lot of content. And that accessibility that we've become very used to in the video world of just being able to try things, to be experimental, to listen to a little bit, to watch a little bit and see if we like it, I think that's something that the consumer has become very interested in. So, you know, preventing us from moving in that direction from a consumer standpoint, I think it's going to be difficult. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we see podcasters, which have sold in the ad model, starting to move to subscription. So there's something about that loyalty and that flexibility with the idea of being able to try a few things that I, I think naturally the consumer is trying to move us towards. You know, it's difficult to accept that as an industry that has worked in a different model. But ultimately, I think the consumer is king. So we're seeing that, that motion in that direction, and I don't see that slowing down. Kurt, any ideas on new I, business models coming? I'm, I'm totally convinced that all-you-can-eat platforms will be the, the main uh, outlet for audio in five years' time, um, as it is with video, as it is in music. Um, and the music industry didn't go down by going with this model. In, con in contrary, it started growing again. And I, but I'm, I, I think it's not like I'm, I don't want to be an advocate of, uh, of uh, streaming platforms. I think we need to acknowledge that, that the consumer likes different models and we need to 
to deliver to all these models. And if, he's, he, if he does want to do a download, fine. If he does, uh, likes to stream, fine. We need to be where the consumer is. That's, that's the most important. I'd right. like to say just um, that I think we're already moving towards not only as consumers having multiple ways of buying and purchasing content, but as publishers, we'd be, we should be looking at multiple sources of revenue for content. You release a book, you have book sales. Then you make a podcast related to the book, you have ad sales on the podcast. You have exclusive content from the author on a newsletter or a paywall. So you're looking at multiple ways to kind of expand the original content that you have that you've already paid for and that you multiply across multiple channels, whether it's on a podcast or in other formats. And I think reaching those consumers and having something that they can purchase at each stage is also another way to increase your revenue and increase your your potential for both audio and for books. Um, and that would be my point, yeah. And I, I think there's so much branding that's happening mm -hmm. now. If you look at like Marvel, right? So they have movies, they yeah. have podcasts, they have books, they have toys. Like that's the way we're moving in, mm. in audio as well. It's content, here's content. And this book may become an audio book, may become a podcast, may become a movie, may become a television show. So it's really opening the ecosystem for intellectual properties. I'd like to give an example from uh, Brazil. Uh, last uh, Two weeks ago, it was Podcast Show London, and I spoke to someone who runs a global group in, uh, in Brazil. What they do when they release a show, which is the same, we're talking about creative content. They release a podcast, whether it's an audio fiction or even a conversational podcast or product. They actually already have an in-house ecosystem of promotion, which is something that doesn't really exist in other industries, whereby as soon as the show comes out, anything that they release, they already have two or three shock shows that they own also that are going to be promoting the content. So the book comes out, and this is the same model that Disney uses. They also own the, the Good Morning America that they're able to send the stars from the movies to go and promote. Um, thinking in that way, um, if you're looking at promoting a book and seeing your marketing model under that kind of ins you know, inspirational model of you have all of these other opportunities to reach your consumer, whatever digital medium it is. And it works. You get results. And in Brazil, it works very well for them. They have millions of listens for their series and immediate response from, from consumers and audience communities that are already around these stars that they've actually helped create and promote. So yeah. Well, very good. Let's go back to the business model, because in, in this interview that I strongly recommend you to listen to, he mentions this advertising-based advertising business model. Do you see room in the audio space, already in podcasting, there is audio-based revenue. Do you see in the audiobook ones? It might not be for free. I mean, we have Netflix now in a business model where you are interrupted, but you pay less. Do you forecast in the next three, four years someone adventuring, offering that kind of service in the market to have people to listen to audiobooks being interrupted by ads, but paying, but a lower tier? I mean, I think it's inevitable but I also see podcasts moving away from that more and more. It's a very tough model, and here we are, you know, in a global sort of standing on the edge of a recession, in a recession. We already see that that's had a huge impact on the podcast industry, mm -hmm. and their revenue is going down. So I think it will be potentially a piece of the market, but I look at myself, right? I, I switched to some ad-supported television models because I have so many subscriptions now, and what I realized very quickly was I, I can't handle it. So <laughs> I'm going to make the choice of I'm going to have less subscriptions but no ads. But if I was 18 or you know, 20 and was in college, I might make a different choice. So having different options mm -hmm. is important. But I do think the ad-supported model, the, there's some issues around that. And it's yeah. really I, I think you made a very good point because in the previous panel, it was very interesting that 22% of the Gen Z uh, generation listen to podcasts. And there was a small data that 12% of them were paying subscription to support their creators. Exactly. So they're willing to pay. Yep. but maybe not that match, and maybe with an ad base. So I think what you're saying, every content has its own business model, because I think today in the publishing sector, we pull all the content together and fit it into a single business model, and maybe we have to start thinking differently, saying mm. every content has its own business model. 
It also has to do with the format, right? Yeah. Because you know, you can interrupt a podcast, it's 45 minutes, you interrupt it two or three times, it's not going to be such a jarring experience. But if you interrupt a chapter in an audiobook, it's going to be jarring. However, if you shorten your chapters and you tell your authors, okay, maybe create, you know, adapt your content in that way, or when you create the audiobook version, shorten it into smaller mini chapters that can be interrupted by ad content you actually create a model that can be monetized in a new way. But giving the consumer the option to do either one is more important than anything, because the yeah. consumer has to be able to make the choice that you made, which is, yeah, I, I don't want to pay for ads, or I, I, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to subscribe to this many different audiobook platforms. Um, and just seeing your format and, and really looking at it as audio stories rather than just saying audio books can also help blur that line for the consumer in a sneaky way, but not in a bad way because they will be able to see the content still and they'll be able to enjoy it just as well. Um, and allowing them to skip the ads if they pay more will be the other way for you to also increase revenue. When I always say, you know, we started the Audio Publishers Association in 1986, it's not the Audio Book Publishers Association, right? So we were thinking even back then, there's lots of different things that you're making that are sold within a book space. Mm -hmm. And what's happening now is that that space is very different. It's an audio space, and that includes music, it includes podcasts, it includes books, it includes all types of materials, originals that we're making. So, you know, we have to, just as we have different types of products, we have to have different types of models. But with a, with a book, if it's 12 hours long, right, you could interrupt at the end of each chapter. Yeah. So. Okay, let's go into artificial intelligence. Paul, during his session, he mentioned that there was a business opportunity for the public sector to use synthetic, synthetic voice to especially like black, blacklist, uh, blacklist or, you know, especially niche categories. Uh, what's your point of view in regards of uh, artificial intelligence? How is it going to help increase this category or not? Well, if the production gets, gets uh, cheaper through, the, through that, obviously one can produce more content. On the other hand, I think it is really important to, to let people know what they're listening to. And I think we should, like, if, uh, if uh, more AI produced stuff comes out, we need to, we need to, to mark it somehow and, and tell people what it is, at least for a while because I think it, it's not fair against the community of narrators and it's not fair against the consumer to just do it. Um, Actually, maybe it will change in five years and yeah. it will not be an issue anymore, but I think for the time being, I, I think that's an important Actually, step. I was reading this morning, the, the EU is going to mandate that any content that is being produced by AI, it has to be made a data so the end consumer knows that it's a piece yeah. of text or audio, whatever, yeah. that is being uh, produced. And I, I think it's I would a good idea. Initially, that. maybe yeah. in the future, it's all AI, so who cares? Yeah. But, uh, but do you think, as you said, you, a lot of people talk about that it will make production cheaper. How cheaper? 30%, 50%, 70%? Do you have, I know it's early stages, but we're talking five years from now. Are publishers going to be able to double their catalogs because with the same budget, they're going to be able to produce many more titles? But even if they double their catalog, if no one purchases it, you know, so. <laughs> Because it sounds jarring, like yeah. a robot is telling you a story. It doesn't sound the same. I would say it's not cheaper at the moment. No, uh -huh. it's yeah. definitely not because I mean it's still very experimental, and I think it it still feels odd to listen to. So I think there will be a shift in a few years where it sounds more natural speech. But at the at the moment, no, it's still. And I understand the concerns because voice actors are all exclaiming, you know, are we going to lose our our work? Um, I think the celebrities and influencers of the world with their own communities are going to benefit from having people that are going to be behind them and going to avoid having a robot version of Bruce Willis or a robot version of Julia Roberts. It, you'll have Julia Roberts, you know, and uh -huh. that person's fans is going to come to the show. If you, I mean, we're talking about celebrity casts just specifically, but yeah. But AI, AI is also and has also been used as a tool in other ways within audio publishing. Yeah. So right now a narrator can record, a human narrator records, and then an AI program can look at it against the text and say, here's where you made the mistakes. Here's what the pronunciation was wrong. Here's where you left out a word. So it is helping production and efficiency in that way. But ultimately, I do think that in a performance environment, 
we want to connect with other people and their interpretation of the words. And I think we're, we're still a ways off from where a machine can have that same interpretation of the word. <coughs> Yeah, and, and well. you know the use of audio, just as a final point, the use of audio is also, we heard it in the panel <coughs> discussions before, uh, is to make us feel less alone. People yeah. play audio because they feel like they want to have, it's, it feels like somebody's in the room with you, you know, I podcast friends, right? Yes. And so if you have an AI doing that, you lose that side of things at the moment, for as now. Well, finally, yes. Yes. As, as well, I've, I'm, I'm convinced if there's a lot of productions uh, with AI voices, um, a lot of audiobook publishers will step up their production value. Okay. They'll add other elements to it to stand out of a crowd. And I think that might be a really good thing for the consumer and that might be a really good development for the, for the industry as a whole. Very good. Well, the organizers have told me that coffee's ready and we have to uh, finish our conversation. It went really, really fast. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your thoughts and coffee's ready.